again, thank you for your patience. Um, sometimes it takes us a little bit to make sure we have all of our pieces in order. Um, my name is Sarah and I co-lead this group with my good friend, Marcy. And you can see there are many leaders tonight from um, Indivisible Illinois, and you'll be meeting them in just a moment. Um, we formed um, the Indivisible Illinois Rural Group in uh, November of 2020 following the election. And the purpose of our group is to bring rural Illinois progressives together on the very first Thursday of the month, every month at 7.30 for discussions and for speakers. Our ultimate goal is to support each other as we work to elect progressives up and down the ballot throughout rural Illinois, well, and everywhere in Illinois in 2022, 2024 and beyond. And we are so thrilled that you have all joined us tonight. It's really a wonderful and exciting night to have so many of you with us here tonight for this presentation. Um, this is no surprise to anyone on this call tonight, but at the core of many of the nationwide efforts right now in the extreme right wing of the Republican Party are either overt or stealth attacks on BIPOC citizens, election suppression, healthcare suppression, and on and on are intentional efforts to especially undermine the rights of minority communities. Obviously, this effort to block the progress of people of color is nothing new. Even our Northern blue state has a history of white supremacy and KKK organizations. So why are we talking about this? First, we are not afraid of taking a hard look at some ugly facets of our history <clears throat> unlike some other people. And we know that in many areas of rural Illinois, we are only a hair's breadth away from, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get people, we're only a hair's breadth away from the kinds of beliefs and activities and overt discrimination that was prevalent in our state in the 1920s, a hundred years ago, and unfortunately we still see today. So we're going to stop for just a moment and have a couple of announcements from our wonderful leaders. And, um, and then I will pass the baton to Marcy to introduce our guest speaker tonight. But first we'd like to start with Lenny, who is one of uh, the leaders of Illinois Indivisible and has kept us um, going for the last five and a half years. So Lenny, take it away and tell us what's coming up with Indivisible Illinois. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you everyone for being here. I was not prepared to give a speech at all, but um, just to give gratitude for you to showing up today. And really that is what it's all about. Um, maybe you were out this weekend for the National Day of Action, either in Chicago or Springfield or anywhere else. I mean, the same actors that are trying to take away our healthcare are also trying to do everything else to take away our vote and suppress us. So we need to stay together. Uh, we need to continue to form coalitions at the local levels. And we need to do that here, especially in Illinois, because other states around the Midwest um, can use our help as well. So um, again, thank you, Sarah, for joining us. so many groups across indivisible uh, rural areas. And we hope that you can join us. We are getting together um, as a statewide network of organizations on uh, November 13th for a convening to revitalize our grassroots because there is so much in the fight ahead and we need everyone on board with us. I will kick it off to Rose, who's also a statewide co-lead at Indivisible Illinois for any other comments. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, Marcy, Lenny. Thanks everyone who has organized. Thank you, Scott. I uh, wanna welcome you all again. And um, what I'm going to offer this evening are actions. Actions are um, something that uh, Indivisible Illinois is uh, very familiar with. And uh, if this is of interest with you uh, to you, I hope you join us. So um, after canvassing and phone banking, we feel that uh, letter writing 
is one of the most impactful things that we can do. And um, we do feel that uh, it is an action that can hopefully level the playing field. There was actually an analysis done. I don't want you to, well, you can if you want to, but I don't want you to just take my word for it. There was a big study. And um, what we did is assess book forward letter writing in 2020. And here's what we found. 17.6 million letters were sent to 14.1 million unique registered voters, resulting in 126,000 net votes. And that's, uh, this is actually a huge percentage, everyone, 0.8 percentage points higher than the control group. Essentially, what we are doing with that information is um, writing letters to Virginia. If uh, you all recall, Virginia has been and will be a bellwe bellwether state, and um, they have passed, if you have been keeping track, sweeping legislation having to do with uh, one area of focus of mine, voting rights, but also climate change, education, health, and other positive legislation. So um, again, we are doing letter writing on Saturday at the Indivisible Illinois Social Justice Alliance Group, very appropriate for this conversation this morning. I'm sorry, this uh, evening. And um, if you are available Saturday at noon, I will have that chat, that uh, link in the chat, and I do hope you join us. Thanks again for being here and back to Sarah. Thank you so much, Rose. You can always hear, no matter no matter what we're talking about, there are always th actions that we can take. And now I'm going to um, pass this off to Marcy because she is going to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, we're going to learn some lessons tonight from a portion of our state's history that is rarely shared. So here you go, Marcy, will you introduce our speaker for us, please? Sure. Th thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, Lenny and Rose. Um, before I introduce the speaker, though, I just want to let you know that Indivisible Illinois does have a, um, a lot of uh, ha does does have a lot of um, groups that you can join other than other than just just um, just the general. Um, for example, we are the ind rural Indivisible group. And um, we have, we ha I put in the chat a link to sign up for the listserv for the Indivisible Rural Illinois listserv and also the Indivisible Illinois um, leaders, leaders Group listserv, which is basically just the statewide group. And you can sign up for both of them and please do. So now I, now I will introduce our speaker who is awesome. Benjamin Beaupre is formerly right wing and he is a self-described self classical liberal. Um, he is a member and has been a member of the Federal Society and a life member of the NRA. And today he works with progressive activists on many causes. Benjamin has done a lot of research into the history of the Ku Klux Klan in Champaign County. He creates posts on Facebook frequently with his findings. Um, reading about his, some of his research has given me a lot of insight as to how racism has become ingrained in the central Illinois and southern Illinois. Please welcome Benjamin Beaupre. Thank you. Welcome, Ben. Hi, everybody. Um, probably not the, the most typical person in uh, liberal circles, uh, progressive circles, uh, or democratic circles uh, until uh, Donald Trump came along. Um, it's hard to view the far right as uh, just a fringe anymore or anywhere close to an insignificant fringe, especially after the last five years. Um, it was hard for me to pick a place on where to start on white nationalism in Illinois. Um, uh, our history of that goes back to the beginning of when it was part of the Northwest Territory, the old Northwest Territory. Um, one of the spots I decided to pick, though, was uh, the Black Hawk War. It was kind of led into the way for the removal of indigenous people in Illinois. Uh, that was in 1932. Uh, interesting fact, uh, that was the war where Lincoln served his militia service. Uh, so I have one president. He didn't see combat, I don't believe. Uh, but there was also a young lieutenant who uh, escorted Black Hawk and uh, other prisoners after the conflict, uh, a lieutenant named Jefferson Davis, who would go on to become the president of the Confederacy. And it was uh, that conflict that pretty much set in stone that uh, indigenous people would have to live on the other side of the Mississippi River out to the west. 
and uh, the lands that uh, they had to vacate uh, became federal lands, which were eventually donated to the states through the Morrell Land Grant Act to uh, sell to pay for public universities, such as the University of Illinois. So the history here is deep, it is bloody. Uh, during that time and into the Civil War, the, uh, what the historians call the Indian Wars were still going on. Uh, massacres and killing of bison and just brutal conflict. And uh, it was a front in one of the civil wars that doesn't get a lot of attention. We hear a lot about Gettysburg or, you know, the campaigns this way and that way or finishing off in Texas, but you don't hear about uh, the alliances that various indigenous tribes made with uh, the Confederacy or the Union to, you know, help their survival in a war of extermination. It's one of the sad parts of uh, being a, a Union kid, uh, learning about General Sherman, you, you think of this tough guy who marched to the sea in total war and it was against the Confederacy, so you, know, you don't feel so bad. But uh, he got promoted after the war and helped run the campaigns against the Native Americans out West. And he used the same total war tactics, uh, specifically and outright explicitly for extermination. Um, and that continued well into 1890 for uh, till the closing of the frontier and um, the massacre wounded me. So uh, that kind of leads into the period we're talking about, but uh, also have to note uh, reconstruction after the Civil War. Um, in the first few years, it was a struggle against uh, the Democratic Party uh, conservatives in the South. Uh, Republicans today like to really hammer home that the Democratic Party was behind the beginning of the KKK, and they, they really want you to know. It was in a lot of the comments uh, on uh, the threads that led to this presentation, uh, as if Democrats are unaware or, or that's not taught in schools. It, as far as I know, uh, we, we all learned that pretty early on. Uh, there's a, kind of a partisan mythology about the party switching uh, to Democrats believe and there's a partisan mythology that uh, Republicans were always anti-racist the whole time that Republicans believe and the truth is messier complicated but uh, at the time yeah uh, it was the Democratic Party white conservatives taking back power through terrorism uh, clan organizations the order of the white Camilla similar groups uh, sometimes it seems like outright war. Um, and uh, once they got control of the localities, then they got control of the states, and then they started getting federal power. And you, you got into a situation where either the Republicans got the president or they had to withdraw from Reconstruction, uh, the troops and everything. And after that compromise under Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, things really went downhill. Um, we, we talk about history a lot as uh, progress. Uh, America always gets better. We have our, our stains. We, we have the slavery. We have the extermination of indigenous people. We, we, we made mistakes. We, we have our sins. We have our original sins. We, but we, we're always marching forward. We're always getting better. We're always you know, improving on rights. And um, after 1890, uh, that wasn't true. Uh, we entered a period that uh, a lot of historians call the racial nadir, uh, where we went backwards. Um, in the South, uh, by 1890 and going forward, they started uh, codifying, uh, keeping Black people in their place, as they put it. And uh, that was Jim Crow. In the North, uh, Black people often referred to it as Jim Crow up here as well, uh, it, we had uh, a certain amount of freedom that wasn't allowed in the South, but in the early 1900s, it wasn't what you'd expect. Um, and it was still going backwards in the North. And it, it's hard to understand why uh, racism 
people, a lot of people think that racism has been around forever, ever since people were people, there was racism, but it was a fairly new concept to apply to a human being uh, in the 16th and 17th century. And throughout the 1800s, it was becoming more of what we would, as modern you know, Americans today, would consider racism in, in the terms we understand. Um, you get into social Darwinism where, you know, the races are inferior in some ways or superior in other ways. And it was really getting complicated by the time of the turn of the century, 1900s, to the point that our textbooks, like children's textbooks and college textbooks, were teaching revisionist history of, of Reconstruction where, you know, the Black people weren't ready to govern yet. They they were too corrupt. They were they, white people were just better at that as a human being. It, they were different, or they were lesser. It, it was it was really painful to read through textbooks that I found that they were they were listed in newspapers here in our archives. The titles and you know you can find them in like places like the Hathi Trust and other archives, um, the U of I archives as well. Uh, all these children's and college textbooks that openly promoted white supremacy. Just no, no question about it. Uh, it was disturbing. Um, but that scientific racism as it developed, combined with the extermination of indigenous populations, because uh, 1890 pretty much ended the, the physical part of the genocide. And we moved on to uh, cultural genocide where we took their children and put them in uh, these residential schools or boarding schools as we call them here in the US. And uh, basically said, if you don't let us have your children, we're gonna take your, your food coupons, basically. Uh, we, we'll, we'll starve you unless you give us your children. And those children were abused and battered and had the, uh, what they refer to as, to killing the Indian to save the man. And uh, there were Indian offenses that included actual authentic dances. Uh, it was illegal for them to, to, to do without uh, white permission. And, and this was at the same time that the Boy Scouts started 1910 and uh, Campfire Girls and uh, was it 1926, we had uh, you know, sports mascots like uh, Chief of Lineiwick. You had white kids doing uh, so-called authentic dances while it was illegal, criminalized and beaten for indigenous children to do the same dances for their people to do the authentic dances as opposed to selling their time uh, for Wild West shows and things like that. You, you had this scientific racism that put them as not the survival of the fittest. We were the, we were the fittest. We, they were vanishing people. It's one of the essential white nationalist myths of the white nationalism in the United States and Illinois in general. And uh, with that same mentality applied to reconstruction revisionism that black people weren't ready to govern yet. They were inferior or somehow not civilized enough yet. That was, that was the other half going in into the 1900s and in textbooks, it, 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 was, it was a dark time, but it got darker. Um, that was the, the stage for uh, Birth of a Nation when it came to Illinois in 1916. Uh, it was based on a book called The Klansman, which uh, was popular here as well. Uh, you can find a, a fraternal fraternity organization on U of I's campus, uh, they had a member from each major fraternity send in a member for the Ku Klux Klan. It was uh, one of the enforcement groups for events and whatnot, uh, all the way back to like 1908, maybe a little bit earlier after the Klansmen came out because uh, it romanticized the Klan as a force for good to protect uh, white women from rapacious black people to, uh, It was a form of chivalry. Uh, it, it, 
and purity and it, it, all the disturbing parts of white nationalism where they're obsessed with white womanhood being protected with uh, the purity of the nation, of the myth, of endless ideas. It, it, it's really twisted. But when the movie came out in 1916 in Illinois, uh, I, I live in Champaign, so uh, most of my research is focused in Champaign County. But when it came to Champaign-Urbana, the, the crowds applauded the Klan. There were great cheers, more cheers, according to reports, for the Klan than for Union soldiers, because they were protecting the white women from this unfair Northern government that was inflicting them with uh, black oppressors is how they saw it. And uh, it, it turned reality on its head. And you'll hear historians sometimes talk about uh, how history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. During actual reconstruction, those few years after the Civil War, you had uh, Democratic newspapers and Republican newspapers and uh, social groups where they were in information silos that might sound familiar because they were two different parallel universes at odds with each other. They couldn't both be true. One was disinformation unhinged from reality. Neither were perfect by any means, but one saw Republicans and black people as this existential threat that was coming for them, that was going to oppress them, that was taking everything from them. And it was just the exact opposite of reality, but people believed it. It, 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 was, it was the information silos of, you could not convince these people that this was not the truth. Meanwhile, they were being incited to violence. They were joining groups. You know, far worse than uh, Proud Boys today, but uh, similar in most places with terroristic violence, just intimidation, blocking people at the polls, thinking that they were the good guys, that they were the patriots. So you have these, these rhymes in history. And uh, in the 1920s, you'll find a lot of rhymes. When we get to the 1920s, the second clan had moved not just uh, in the South, but uh, all throughout the North. 1921, 1922, it's all over Illinois. It's being spread uh, by open Klan ministers. Uh, there was a, a reverend out of Mattoon, uh, Reverend McMahon, who uh, was kind of a regional preacher. And he would pop up everywhere I looked. Uh, big events, getting people wound up, openly admitted to, to Clan membership and supporting it. Uh, and it wasn't just small towns. It wasn't something where these were uneducated, you know, redneck folks. Uh, I mean, I consider myself a crazy redneck. And, you know, I don't deem it an insult per se unless somebody's being snobby over it. But uh, this wasn't just regular working folk class in the in in the rural areas. This this was people who could afford cars, they had automobile parades, which wasn't very common in the 1920s. I mean, that, that, that took having some spare income. Being in fraternal organizations generally meant that you were well off enough that you could have some spare time, which wasn't easy for the working class usually, let alone having some extra bucks for dues. And that's probably another thing that's probably hard to understand from our, our viewpoint. Uh, fraternal organizations were big, a big, big thing back then. You had the Knights of Pythias, you had the Elks, you had the Moose, you had the Lodges, you had uh, all sorts of organizations. What you didn't have was uh, sports. <laughs> you didn't have uh, radio in most places yet. The university had probably one of the earliest radio towers and it didn't have sports for a while. So you had a lot of people who had some spare time and a little bit of extra cash and bored. And uh, one thing you can say about the Second Klan movement is a lot of cosplay. You had people dressing up in Klan outfits that weren't necessarily like the original. It was more like what you read in the Klansman book or in Birth of a Nation. They were playing dress up, uh, fiery crosses and all. That, that, was, that was out of the book. That wasn't something so much in the original Klan so much. Uh, so 
you, you have a lot of that, but those other fraternal organizations were segregated. The Knights of Pythias was whites only. The Elks, the, the Moose had advertisements in the paper just for white people and explicitly said so. So the Klan wasn't really all that much different from the other fraternal organizations at the time, except for there was the implied intimidation. They, they would argue that they didn't have a, uh, it wouldn't be a racist bone in their body because racism wasn't the thing back then, but they didn't have hate for anybody. They, they would argue over and over that they weren't anti-Negro was the term at the time. They weren't anti-Negro, they weren't anti-Jew, they weren't anti-Catholic, they weren't anti-anybody, they swore. And speech after speech and public event after public event, they were going on and on about how they were just concerned about the rights of Protestant Christian white men. And uh, that might sound pretty familiar today as well. Uh, they, they even complained about the divisive uh, textbooks in schools pitting one group against another group. Uh, they were extremely anti-communist. Uh, 1919 to 1920 is the first Red Scare. And if you want a, a sneak peek at the anti-communist hysteria of today, uh, going back to the 1920s is a good spot to start because all the arguments you hear now, all the arguments that you heard during the John Birch Society craziness, all the arguments you heard uh, in favor of the... Uh, House Un-American Activities Committee, all, all the crazy conspiracies about communism, they get their start in the 1920s and not just from the Klan. Uh, you get uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, the uh, American Legion and its auxiliary. You, you have folks that are just adamantly so anti-communist that even the civil rights movement, uh, anybody agitating for equal rights is deemed a uh, a useful idiot, a fellow traveler, someone who's trying to undermine the United States and give it a bad name to uh, help start that, you know, communist revolution here. And it's uh, it's a really dark time. And uh, I just kind of want to emphasize that it wasn't just small towns, like. You'd have places like Tuscola where you'd have a march go through and, you know, it, that's pretty big, but also Villa Grove, also uh, downtown Urbana, through Champaign to Muhammad. You know, uh, they rode the inner urban, uh, the old system of uh, rail cars. Uh, it connected them because uh, early in the 1920s, we didn't have a lot of hard roads connecting the towns at all. So if you were trying to take an automobile from one place to another, there's a good chance you get stuck in the muck with Illinois weather. It was just as bad then as it is now, muddy. But uh, before that, just a lot of interurban travel, you'd have thousands of people showing up in places like Homer, Illinois, just little tiny places. Uh, you'd have major events just in Peoria, in uh, Springfield. You, you'd have them in between in small towns afterwards, but you'd have Stranger things where uh, pretty much any time you had a, a little town that had at least a Protestant church, which almost all of them did, you'd have the Klan show up, uh, usually with the support of the minister, with the donation, uh, with uh, asking for a show of support. Um, in uh, Morton, Illinois, uh, where my grandpa was a fifth grader, they came out uh, over the summer and uh, burnt crosses on both the public school grounds, high school and grade school. But uh, they also worked it out with the principal to do a fire drill. So all the kids had to come outside and the Klan pulled up in an automobile and gave a big lecture about Klan principles and uh, the importance of 100% Americanism and all that, which is uh, may not sound like something too terrifying, but uh, my grandpa was German. And uh, they, they really hated hyphenated Americans. And Morton was full of hyphenated Americans. So it, it, they, they were doing it for a reason. And uh, they also donated uh, sports equipment because, of course, they're good guys. And they want to show off that they're good guys. And in the Morton News the next day, the principal thanked them for it and appreciated all their, their good work. 
So that was the time we were living in. This this was the mainstream clan, not the the fringe we see today where they're openly just awful and terrible and they're trying to be the vanguard, that they're trying to be the worst thing and you know, kind of shock people into supporting them or you know, opposing them so they can get more press. This this was the MAGA of the time. They were going for a broad mainstream appeal and they got it. Um, in uh, 1924 uh, politics, you'd have uh, clan supported candidates all over. Uh, Governor Small at the time, he, he came down to the clan headquarters in Urbana, which wasn't a subtle place. It was right next to downtown Urbana and had a giant electric fiery cross on the roof. They had giant electric monster Ks for their events. They did not hide who they were. The exalted Cyclops was a very open public figure and often interviewed for clan related articles in the local papers around the area. Uh, of course he won. Uh, a lot of the clan politicians who uh, helped throw that event together won. It wasn't all Republicans like it was in Champaign County. Champaign County, it was a lot of Republicans uh, on the state level. The, the Grand Dragon and Klan Raiders like Glenn Young, who's infamous for uh, taking over Heron, Illinois and uh, Bloody Williamson County, which is a great book if you ever get a chance to read Bloody Williamson. Uh, he uh, was talking about how he had always been a Democrat his whole life because, well, it was the obvious white supremacist party for a long time. But uh, by 1924, he was out in support of Republicans because they, they had pretty much turned their back on all, all of that liberal stuff and were going all, all in with the Klan. And, uh, it was like that in a lot of Northern states, including Indiana, uh, who uh, by that next year was kind of embroiled in scandal with the Grand Dragon with a murder. And it was just a terrible thing that just kept on pummeling them in the news, but uh, the Klan backed governor there, oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I don't have it in my notes here. I think it was Jackson, uh, but local elections, uh, a lot of state elections. Uh, few going to the US House of Representatives that I could find in uh, the actual dues books, uh, we have uh, some of the old financial records of the Klan that didn't burn in the fire. Uh, they, uh, they tended to uh, disappear their records and everybody was after them because one thing the Klan hated was exposure. So it, that's still true to this day. No, nobody likes to be on the camera you know, a, as a Klan member unless they're intentionally doing so. And uh, you'll see a lot of that to this day that it's usually only the fringe leaders that want to be really associated with that kind of image. You, you don't join a group that has to constantly explain that they aren't anti this and anti that and if they aren't actually anti all those things. It's just not how it works. Uh, they, they, they ran a good PR game for a while, but it fell apart. Uh, 1925, 1926, they had huge parades in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's videos online. Uh, the auxiliaries, uh, they had women's auxiliaries. So you'll, you'll see uh, clan women in uh, long dresses, high heels. They had uh, junior auxiliaries for boys and uh, the tri -Ks, uh different than the, the tri -K clubs spelled with a C club uh, for girls. Uh, there, there's, it, it can be hard to pick them apart in the paper, but uh, usually, usually, uh, if you're digging through newspaper archives, if you see a tri-K club with the uh, club spelled with a K, that, that was a clan auxiliary group. And we had some of those still going on into 1928 and all that. Uh, they started to fade away with all the scandals, where the dues money was going, where, you know, there were so many murders uh, just between feuding clansmen. It, it was a group that praised vigilantes. So it, it wasn't like, Nobody could have seen that coming, but during that whole period from 1921 to about 1928, they really held on to the idea that they were the law and order group, and 
they got a lot of police in their numbers. Uh, in Champaign-Urbana, that included uh, the state's attorney, uh, that included uh, a couple of sheriffs, one, uh, one dues paying, one was just very openly supportive and uh, actually worked with the Klan Raider, Glenn Young, who was uh, notorious in Williamson. Uh, it included uh, many Urbana chiefs of police, uh, a lot of uh, chief watchmen and uh, a jailer. Uh, pretty much, it, if you, you dig through the records long enough, you, you find folks that were really for it, for the, the law and order bit, even though they were promoting vigilante style justice, intimidation. And this is the same period where, you know, if uh, anybody's read uh, James Lowen's book on sundown towns, uh, this is the same period where people are, uh, black people are fleeing Illinois towns and towns are becoming all white. Uh, that, that wasn't the case in 1890. Uh, black people, just like anybody else, go to where jobs are, where family is. Uh, you have normal patterns of migration. And uh, during the Great Migration, especially after uh, World War I, uh, it, the shift was to all white towns, all these sundown, all white towns, all across the towns. And there were some safe hamlets and safe cities like uh, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, I think there was a pretty sizable black population around Homer that was able to stick it out. But uh, in 1908, you had uh, the Springfield riots, uh, they call them race riots, but they were more like pogroms uh, that brought about the NAACP in response. Uh, East St. Louis in 1917, uh, Chicago is part of the red summer across the entire United States of violence against uh, black people who were succeeding. It really threw the whole Booker T. Washington motto of, we can build our own success, prove ourselves as independent people that we deserve these rights. Uh, it, it turned it on its head because every time black people were successful, white people burned their businesses down. They got jealous. They got very angry. If they tried to move in to their neighborhood, it, it, it became deadly. And you know, by the 60s, that included bombings and uh, all the same violence we saw in the 1920s. But uh, the armaments increased, especially after World War II, uh, access to explosives. So uh, in the 20s, there were some bombings. But uh, compared to the 60s, uh, you saw more shootings than the bombings like you saw in the 60s. The, uh, the Klan didn't disappear, though. It, the, uh, the people that I researched, I, I tracked some of the Klan ministers and some of the politicians and some of the other members all the way to their graves, all the way to their obituaries. What happened was that the newspapers, who were sometimes run by Klan members as well, a lot of Klan publishers, they just didn't report it anymore. So you know, the exalted Cyclops of the Champaign County Klan went on to become a judge and stayed a judge for years. And you know, one of the newspapers reported how fair he was to black people in his court, how he wouldn't you know, partially judge anybody over those kind of issues, not mentioning his Klan background, which was public and known. He was open about it in the same paper. They, they just toss that aside. They never mentioned in the obituary. But if you go to the obituary, you can find his pallbearers were other Klansmen. Uh, they dues paying. Um, same with the mayor of Urbana, John Gray afterwards. He was uh, in the Urbana police and uh, sheriff and you know, open Klan supporting guy. And they, they never mentioned that, uh, even though that, that would have been a fascinating part of the history of someone that they were covering, it, they just, it got whitewashed. It, not censored, not, not blocked, you know, just nobody wanted to hurt someone's reputation like that. And by the thirties, it was pretty well known that the Klan wasn't the thing to be in. Uh, you know, you'd have newspaper editorials talking about it, Klan members like Hitlerites before Hitler was you know, Hitler in our mind with the, the genocide there, they were 
comparing the early Nazi tactics to clan tactics of intimidation and the, the, the fascisti in Italy, uh, people knew they were bad news and the violence going wrong with it, but it was so mainstream and so popular that people just kind of let it, let it slide. And uh, I think that's a big part of why it's not in the history textbooks. It's uh, not just that people don't want to talk about it. It's a lot of people know not to mention it. They, you know, that let the past be in the past. We hear that a lot still to this day. We hear, uh, you know, that black people should, uh, you know, lift themselves up by their bootstraps. And, you know, I, I go through this history and people were saying that during reconstruction, people were saying that after the Klan ensured, you know, white supremacy over Southern governments, people were saying that in 1890s, people were saying that during the Klan rise, they were saying it in the 50s, they were saying in the 70s, they're saying it today that somehow through all of this, and, you know, this is only getting into the 20s and 30s, let alone the, the racial covenants and everything that came next because the second Red Scare brought it all back again. And if you go through some of the archives of uh, the uh, American Legion and the uh, auxiliaries, the anti-civil rights movement rhetoric as part of anti-communism is, it, it gets just outright white supremacist too, especially, you know, like uh, with Urbana, we had a, a John Birch Society uh, couple who were, uh, in the leadership for both the the Legion and the Legion Auxiliary, so it, it depending on uh, who got the power, you you could end up with some folks who were registering uh, potential radicals because uh, they'd have little blacklists like the Daughters of the American Revolution had at the end of the 1920s, and uh, through this you also had eugenics. Uh, Illinois didn't pass a lot of the policy that uh, eugenicists wanted, but we had a lot of the science. Um, Professor Hayes over to U of I, he had a very, very popular book on eugenics and race as part of his sociology introduction that uh, uh, was very popular in Japan and Germany. He got uh, inducted into the uh, German Sociology Association's you know, honors system over there because uh, they, they really loved his race science, his uh, racial hygiene uh, science through eugenics and all that was going on at the same time. It, it, it's hard to overstate just at such a dangerous place the United States was in the 1920s before Hitler made a lot of the ideas that America was exporting look bad. It, I don't want to say it could have happened here. Because if you ask any indigenous person, it did happen here. We were just looking to see who was next. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm open to them. Hey, uh, th thank you, Ben. And we do have we did have some questions in the chat. Um, first of all, um, Karen Fre Karen Fresco. I mean, I um, now. Uh, I'm put, put a link to your blog in the chat, but Karen Fresco was asking about reading material, and she also had another uh, another couple questions. Karen, you want to you want to ask Ben what your questions were? Um, Amarcy, I think uh, it was a question about the dates of what Benjamin was talking about, and somebody responded. Uh, okay, I'm very interested in what. You know, one of the most interesting things, Benjamin, and what you said was what was happening in Homer, in Ogden, in Tuscola, Villa Grove, Muhammad. That's what I want, I want to read more about. So if you had some sources, websites or publications where we could dig in and find out some more about the history of this stuff where we live, I'm in Urbana, um, I'd be very interested. Put a couple of quick links in the chat. Uh, one's just for the, the main blog. Uh, has a lot of newspaper clippings for Champaign County. Um, also uh, a second one just for uh, area towns that include Ogden and Homer and whatnot. Um, there's a sources link on there that uh, mostly just talks about the newspaper archives and books and just uh, 
uh, the historical archives in Urbana and uh, Homer and other places that I've uh, been digging through on microfilm and all that fun stuff. Uh, the uh, the blog links for the individual towns are mostly just uh, the activities and events that I could find, uh, just documented with the newspaper I found them in. Like it, it was the Urbana Courier, what year? Uh, it was uh, in the Mattoon Journal Gazette, you know, things like that. I, I have some links on there for uh, the specific uh, clan ministers and uh, some, uh, the CU clan, it was such a hub for all the area clans that uh, for the, the one in Champaign-Urbana, I had to break it up into a, a bunch of different posts, uh, just kind of how it got started, who was behind it, you know, how the, the state's attorney played coy about hearing about the clan and it turns out he's member 180 you know <laughs> the the clan records and where i got them it, it's all on there but uh it it wasn't just there that i found it because they moved around a lot and uh so that that's how i found out about my grandpa which is far out of champaign county it was uh i was following a event that was happening in peoria and i stumbled across uh an archive for the Morton News. I'm like, hey, hey you might have something there. I mean, it might be something interesting when the Klan popped up in Tazewell County or something. And sure enough, they were burning crosses right on this grade school lawn, having fire drills where you had to come out and get preached to, to the, by the Klan. So everywhere I looked, uh, the Klan popped up, uh, not just in Illinois, but pretty much everywhere I looked throughout the North, uh, Oregon was really bad about it. Okay, um, Jim McGrath also had a question. Yeah, Ben, I was wondering, you mentioned fraternities in relationship to uh, Champaign and University of Illinois. Does that apply to any of the like existing fraternities or the social fraternities that were or are on campus now? I'm sure some. Uh, basically, the, the Ku Klux Klan fraternity on campus uh, had a representative from every fraternity at the time, uh, and it went from 1908 to basically when the National Klan movement made the Klan look bad again because they were burning crosses on campus. Uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan fraternity on campus changed its name to Two Moss, which was supposed to be some sort of Indian word, but uh, as far as I know, they just made it up, uh, which what they did. Uh, there was a lot of playing Indian as part of fraternal organizations. There was even a, a red man group that was all white people playing Indian as a uh, fraternal organization. It, it, it was a, a strange and twisted time, but uh, I, I don't actually know the current uh, fraternal organizations. The, there's a list on the, the campus clan. I can put the link in there where it has the names of the fraternities they were part of. Uh, in in the main picture, so I'll put a link down there for you. Thank you. Okay, there also um, Steve, Stephen Dornbush had a question. Hello, thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit later as far as you know what decades and period, but just you mentioned an aside relating to uh, anti-communism, Red Square, HUAC. And and also that it started it you know with Russia's civil war right after the revolution so it's continuous interest. Um, I was wondering I, I used to I have some pamphlets I haven't read them in thirty or forty years from the John Birch Society, uh, two or three all uh, against uh, more or less Martin Luther King's civil rights movement and it's nothing more or less nothing but red baiting, and so I don't have an opinion but uh, my question is. Were they blinded uh, by, you know, an obsession obsession with Russia and a red scare, or were they using it as an excuse and they were actually motivated wholeheartedly in preservation of Jim Crow? I think it varied just like it does today, depending on the person. Uh, I mean, you have folks who truly believe that. Uh, they're they're fighting against communism and you have other folks where you know their motivations are more obviously racial but you know you we don't have uh, mind reader machines so you know the the overlap it, it it can be tough 
mean, uh, it, it's hard to say one way or the other because they're all achieving the same reality, the same activity. So it, I, I, I don't want to give them a pass on any of it because, you know, it's all part of the, the same game. But, uh, you know, with the, after seeing it happen over and over again from the first Red Scare to the, the 30s where the Red Scare kind of came back a little bit, it's not what they usually call the second Red Scare because, you know, they, they like to hit the, the high notes on that one because it was just kind of a constant Red Scare. And, uh, but when it, when it came back, the same arguments came back. The, the people who were really obsessed with uh, white supremacy really found a way to jump on the anti-communist line to get it. And even uh, like, uh, oh, the lose, uh, uh, Bring the War Home is a really good book about uh, the rise of uh, far right militia groups and white nationalists after uh, Vietnam. It, it, a lot of things happen after uh, military conflicts. You have a, a lot of folks with uh, a lot of resentments and a lot of uh, spare military equipment and arms and explosives and uh, people wanting to organize. And, you know, it, it doesn't take much uh, for uh, military leaders to organize something really dangerous, uh, even though they, they're just a small part of the military. Uh, it's always been kind of a, a through line in uh, American, you know, not necessarily conservatism, but we, we've always had two conservatisms. We've had the kind that believes in classical liberalism, the enlightenment, reason, rationality, you know, democratic institutions to a degree. And then we've had the conservatism that's embraced by the Confederacy where, you know, you, you have to keep this thing pure. It's based on the mythologies. It's based on nationalism. It's based on all the things that take us down that uh, with uh, Umberto Eco called the uh, ur fascism, you know, the, the 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 parts of fascism that go beyond just a strict authoritarian government, and, you know, regimented society, but uh, the the things that wind people up like that, like uh, oh, I don't know, I'm just kind of rambling there, but uh, it, it it it's that that strain of conservatism that leads to that far right fringe over and over and over again. It, it's always there, but uh, it, it, when it materializes, it, it, it can be part of a perfect storm like the 1920s where it all kind of comes together at the right time. And in the 1920s, maybe all it was missing was uh, Donald Trump, who knows. Okay, um, next Thank we you. have, oh, sorry. <laughs> next we have Brooke Croak. Brooke? Okay. Um, well, I guess we'll go on. Well, I guess we'll go on to Leslie Roberts then. Leslie? Thank you. Um, thank you, Ben, for all your research and your presentation. I was wondering what's happening now is is it, um, are there a lot of proud boy types that are, uh, are they rising? Is it generation to generation handed down attitudes? Uh, it's always a little bit different. Like, uh, like I said, the, the historians like to say, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So you have a lot more, uh, uh, they're trying to be more inclusive for fascists, which is weird, uh, but it's not entirely new. Um, you'd have uh, some extremist groups in the past that would uh, accept Jewish people. You'd have some that, like Father Coughlin uh, with uh, Catholicism pushing uh, fascist ideas. Uh, depending on the group, uh, like the American Legion would, uh, you know, was full of veterans of different stripes. They they didn't discriminate against uh, Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans as much depending on the chapter. Sometimes they had separate chapters because uh, some of the more 100% American types didn't want them in their group. And uh, the, the Black American Legion posts were separate. Like uh, if you look at Danville during the flooding in, I think it was 
1932, I might be a little off on the year a little bit, but they had the American Legion post come out to help with the flooding. And uh, the, they, they did that segregated. They had the, the, the Black Legion post do a separate part of uh, one of the rivers that was over flooding. And uh, they didn't even communicate in person. They had to have the message sent uh, through a proxy. Uh, when was the, this? Uh, I believe 1932, but it might have been a little bit later than that. I'd have to check through my notes. What are our attitudes nowadays? Uh, nobody wants to be a racist. That's the boogeyman term. Nobody wants to be a monster. Everybody thinks that they're a patriot, that they're fighting for America. And uh, the Klan wasn't any different back then. Uh, but back then, white supremacy wasn't the bad word. Uh, that was just facts as far as they were concerned. They would talk about how they didn't have uh, any hatred. They, they didn't have any thing against any animus against anybody, but uh, white supremacy, that was just facts as far as they were concerned. And uh, nobody really disagreed. Like the editorials in the Courier and the News Gazette and other lo local papers, they didn't disagree with the Klan on that stuff. They were worried about the vigilante stuff, uh, trying to make sure that things didn't get out of hand and violence and all that. Today, uh, they can be more inclusive with uh, like Western chauvinism, which is kind of a euphemism for uh, white governance and white control and white power, but it, it it's a little bit more fluctuating on, you know, other ideas. You can have groups like the Proud Boys where they, they have uh, some minority members and leaders where they're saying the same white nationalist arguments, but they're giving it a kind of a, a better marketing. And you, you've seen that before with the John Birch Society, they'd have uh, uh, black conservatives come on and make the same arguments as uh, Oliver P. Revelo, uh, Revelo P. Oliver, who was a big, crazy anti-Semitic white nationalist who was big here in uh, Champaign-Urbana for many, many years. Uh, he, he would, uh, he would do speaking tours and they'd have a, a Latino from, uh, Cuba, uh, do an anti-communist speeches, uh, along with, uh, people who said they were, uh, uh, formerly with, uh, radical, uh, black groups trying to work with communists and things like that. So you, you have a lot of the same tactics, but they, they play a little bit better than mainstream audiences today because anything that can help make the ideas that are popular towards protecting white hegemony and white demographics. If you can make that sales pitch without sounding racist, you're gonna find an audience receptive to it. And that, that hasn't changed. Um, hey, uh, Benjamin, we're, we're, we're at uh, 8.32 and we wanna honor your time. Could we, could we grab you for about three more minutes? I think we just have a, a couple more questions. Isn't that right, Marcy? Yeah, we have right? yeah. Yes. Yeah, you, you can keep me around as long as you need. Okay. <laughs> yes. So yes. Yeah, so we have. We have. Um, I, I apologize. There was one person that that I missed in the chat. Ben Schmack, and then it, so it's Ben Schmack, and then Kevin, and then Robin. Okay. So um, and we'll um and um and any um anybody who can stay, please. We would love you to stay if you have to go. We understand. Okay. So. So Ben Schmack, and then Kevin Cosgrove, and then Robin Potter. Ben? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the talk, uh, Benjamin. It's been great. Um, actually, first, before I ask my question, I just want to thank you for bringing up the uh, uh, anti-communist aspect of, of this, because I think it is something that sort of gets background attention in a lot of uh, scholarly work, but doesn't. Uh, it, it's actually kind of forms the focus of a lot of my research as well. And I think it's very important for not just historically, but for the here and now. Uh, I actually put out a, a shameless plug here. Sorry, I actually put out an article in the American Studies Journal in 2019 uh, about communist anti-Klan activism in Southern Illinois. So um, I think there's a lot of stuff people need to sort of start finding out. So I'd love to hear more about the Central Illinois Klan and their anti-communism. But my question was more specifically, um, sort of how large was the sort of Central Illinois Klan in comparison to uh, the Southern Illinois Klan, which I think is maybe a little more famous um, especially in counties like Williamson and Franklin. Um, and also, was there much um, interstate communication between these regional clans uh, or was the Central Illinois much more sort of local or tribal and or were they in kind of 
contact with one another. Yeah, uh, it's hard for me to guess on the the numbers. Uh, I mean, it yeah. really seemed to vary with uh, how many people they could attract to their events, and I don't really have any good uh, record books for you know how many people were paying dues in uh, twenty four and twenty five compared to what I was able to find in the clan records here. So I'm not sure how to make a direct comparison. I think you know it was probably comparable per capita per population. I, I, I doubt it was too much different. Uh, basically where it was allowed to get away with being itself, I mean, as opposed to places like Chicago, where you had uh, a lot of radical groups and anti-Klan groups that were constantly trying to expose them, or uh, in Springfield, uh, some of the more statewide folks were sometimes outed I think it was a little bit harder for them, but in the smaller rural areas, I think it was just as many members as they could get. Uh, mm -hmm. They weren't they weren't unpopular, but uh, across the state uh, with the Indiana, uh, I saw constant travel because uh, mm. you, you know newspapers back then it was basically their Facebook, so they had those little local news sections where so and so had so and so over for dinner, so and so went into town for this, someone was shopping at this place. It's yeah. a lot of just going to uh clan hot spots in indiana you'd see these these guys travel or their wives uh, who did a lot of the organizing uh it's oh yeah uh, miss bolsheviki uh, fighting miss bolsheviki it's a really good book about uh conservative women and how uh that movement kind of got started and uh brought us folks like bill shafley and whatnot mm -hmm. so that, that was a really good one for kind of the crossover and who was doing a lot of the the, the work behind the scenes because uh, they were very, very active. And uh, you'd see a lot of their wives in, like in the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, at the same time because uh, the morals and vice and the purity there was always kind of a big issue. So I, I don't know about exact comparisons. It just from uh, events, it seems like it was very similar. You know, if the town was a such and such size, it'd have about the same. Okay, great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So, yeah, next is, is, is Kevin. Thank you. How you doing? Howdy. Thank you. Good. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Good. I, I definitely want you guys, everybody on this call to listen to this, and I want you guys to listen, really listen to what I'm going to say, and this is from my heart. Okay. Um, I'm somebody who grew up in New Jersey. I live in North Carolina. I am a moderate guy. I'm not some extreme dude. I don't own a shotgun. I don't drive a pickup truck. Um, I voted for Bill Clinton. I voted for Barack Obama in his first election. I voted for Donald Trump in the first election. Okay. And I'm a, I'm a slight conservative now. Okay. And there are plenty of people like me who I interact with. And I interact with a lot of people left, center, right, everything like that. And I don't want people to, uh, the one thing I see a lot of is not, you know, congenial, just talking to each other as, you know, let's just say 99% of the people on this call are liberal, right? Liberal left somehow. As somebody who's a moderate myself, I find that there's a real bad problem that everybody's starting to label each other in certain ways. And it's good to hear that the speaker says that, you know, there are moderate, you know, conservatives, which there are, and there's a lot of us. So, you know, as far as, you know, the whole idea of it masking some kind of, you know, conservatives masking some kind of race behind their efforts or whatever in their beliefs, I, I, I highly dis dispute that. You know, from the conservative people that I interact with that are all stripes and colors from New Jersey to wherever I may know them from, you know, and I'm talking Filipino Americans, people I used to work with and everything like that. We value everybody of in individual uh, colors and stripes. We just, we don't, we just dispute the ideas behind it. You know what I mean? Like, so we are for indiv individual freedom. We are for sovereignty. We are for all these ideas that are constitutional ideas. And we think that those are good ideas. And no, we don't put any racism behind it. We actually look at people as individuals. And that's the problem that I think now is that it's being labeled as, even though you're slight conservative you're some, and you voted for Trump, you're somehow aligned with those ideas. That's false. 
there was two people to vote for in an election. Well, three, maybe. Right. You had to choose one side and people made a choice. And the fact that people just because they they pulled the the the, the voting hammer on, on Trump, that somehow. Those ideas that you had mentioned before are ingrained in the person like myself, I reject that. And the people that I know fully reject those ideas as well. You know, the guy's not the nicest guy in the world. He's a he's a business tycoon from New York. I worked in New York City for many years. He's an arrogant guy that got his way, right? He was he was a real estate tycoon that didn't have to say no to anybody. He had a lot of women because he had power. And that gets to your head when you're in that kind of environment. So he was a guy that that was a response to the Tea Party in the previous election. And what the people voted for, and I'll, I'll end with this. The, the conservative people who are moderates, okay, the, per, the conservative people who are moderates that voted for Trump voted to go Kevin, against. Yes, Kevin, now, yes, yes, we need to wrap it up. Yeah, this, this, we need to wrap it up. And this is kind of off the beaten path a little bit. And we do have one other person that really has, wants to ask a question. So this, this is, uh, it's not that, not that we, um, we don't value your opinion, but it is a little off the beaten path. Well, so, I, I, people hear that what I'm talking about. I'll just say this for fun. Okay. Um, right, and, anyway, Robin, um, um, maybe you, you can ans ask your question. I was going to ask. Yes, you thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh, is okay, it okay? Robin. Yes. Oh, thank you. So I have a question more on contemporary data and research. So particularly in Southern Illinois, like Marion County and in industrial plants, down there, for example, what is the current data on the white supremacist groups, the Klan, um, and other groups like that operating, and where are they operating? And is there any data and research on their prevalence and growth and operations in industrial plants? For example, I know from some intel, like you could go into the Aishin parking lot, Aishin manufacturing, which is one of the largest manufacturing plants in Illinois, and there's Confederate flags all over the parking lot. So can you share, Ben, do you have recent data? Uh, I don't personally. Uh, for more recent things, uh, I'd probably defer to like uh, the Anti-Defamation League and the Center, uh, oh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, they usually keep track of some of the more extreme groups right now. Um, I'm not sure if there's a really great source for that because they tend to keep their numbers quiet. Um, it, 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 I'd say it's always there, but it, it always kind of varies more on uh, if folks are riled up more towards the mainstream groups. Uh, like uh, there is a lot of today versus the vanguard. Like uh, in the 90s, you had a, a lot of groups kind of go very open, like uh, Matt Hale and all that uh, Church of the Creator stuff was very, very public. But, you know, after he faded away, a lot of the really far right folks here in town, they didn't go away. They still lived here. It's just they weren't very in the public eye. So it, it's probably something where uh, those folks track, you know, modern current uh, movements so uh, I, I wouldn't know much about it I, I mostly dig through century-old microfilm so wouldn't be able to help much there um i think we're going to wrap things up and um we really appreciate all of your your research that you've done benjamin and all of the good questions that we've had here today um a fascinating peek into um illinois uh, side of Illinois that we don't often think about. And it's important for us to know um, what has happened here in the past and, um, and keep that in mind as we are watching the news today. So a big, hand, big round of thank you for our wonderful guest speaker, Benjamin. And um, remember that our Rural Indivisible group will be here again um, the first Thursday of November at 7.30 in the evening. And if you are on our Indivisible Rural Listserv, which was posted in the um, chat, um, 
then uh, you will certainly get notification of what we will be doing the first week of November. But everyone, big thank you for, for Benjamin spending such a great amount of time with us this morning and that this evening. And thank you so much for your willingness to go over time. I think, I think when you see the questions and you see uh, the interest, um, obviously this, this was really wonderful. So we thank you so much and we'll sign off. Um, unless Marcy, did you have one more thing to say? Are you okay? Yeah, I, I think I'm fine. Thank you very much, Ben. You you rock. I have to say you rock. So. <laughs> well, good night, all, and hope to see you in November. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Bye, right. y'all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jessica, for your help. Thank you all. Great presentation tonight. <laughs>